So, hello everybody. I am Martin Inček. Uh, I live in Czech Republic. I uh, work for Global Web Index, writing Elm full time, which is awesome. And uh, we are hiring, so maybe uh, catch me uh, during the break. And so I want to talk to you about Elm in Elm, which is funny because Richard just talked about this. <laughs> so uh, if he didn't, I would expect like two reactions. One is like, yes. And second one is like, what are you talking about, Martin? Like, what do you mean Elm in Elm? So what I mean is writing the Elm compiler itself in Elm. And uh, maybe just to uh, clear some things, uh, like set something straight right away. This is uh, not a try to like throw the old Elm compiler written in Haskell out of the window. Even though we Czechs have great uh, experiences like throwing people out of the window, uh, this is not it, right? So, so okay, you want to write uh, Elm compiler in Elm, but but why, right? Like, what do you gain? So uh, the first thing is uh, given it would be written in Elm, it's an Elm program, we can publi publish it as uh, Elm library, right? And so you can think about like uh, what use cases does it unlock? Right, I have in back of my mind. I have my example of like uh, Elm Slack bot that uh, that would live in the Elm Slack, and you give it like uh, Elm uh, source code, at, and it uh, interprets it and gives you like the result. You know, you might have uh, something uh, in your head too, like maybe some kind of like meta programming, some stepping debugger, whatever. Um, I think I think it unlocks uh, quite a lot of possibilities. Uh, the second thing is I'd like it to be learning resource, probably similar to like uh, how Richard's Elm SPA example is a project that people go read to see how SPAs are done, like idiomatically in Elm. So possibly this could be like uh, the project that people go to to see how compilers are done, right? Because you can say like, okay, this is not Haskell. We do not have like the do, do notation. Like, what do you do? Like, uh, how do you, you know, move around that? And so we could probably like, uh, you know, really clean it up and document like the best practices for writing compilers in Elm. And uh, so that means that some of the values uh, it has is like, uh, you know, being clear, being simple, being beautiful, uh, well documented, well tested. You know, like just. Uh, Clean, clean code, and uh, only then optimize for like speed and so on. And uh, what these two uh, points or, or like values uh, give us is uh, that it's, uh, it's suddenly it's experimentation ready. So people can go and uh, you know look at it and try different things with it, like experiment because. Uh, you know, it's written in Elm, which Elm programmers know, and uh, it's newcomer friendly, right? It's new people friendly. And uh, so you might say, okay, but we can already do this with the, with the Elm compiler written in Haskell. But, you know, it's written in Haskell, so that's some, some like barrier. Uh, and like, I do not mean this in a bad way, but, uh, you know, Evan probably like optimized it for Evan, right? He didn't optimize it for like uh, newcomers. So so we can we can focus on that. We can focus on like being accessible and uh, allow people to try stuff. And we can we can make it extensible. So so in the past, you know, when uh, I don't know the name of the person, but uh, when uh, when somebody wanted to write the Elm to Elixir compiler, they probably had to like uh, write the parser themselves or like fork the Elm compiler and try to like uh, understand it. Uh, we can we can make it really easy to reuse most of the pipeline and just write like different like uh, emission strategy instead of JavaScript right to Elixir or whatever. Or you can try to uh, you know extend it from the other end like try a different uh, like try some variant of the Elm syntax like what happens if we try the where syntax, right? Instead of let, like where does that lead? So, so this is kind of like it gives you uh, like a sandbox to play with. Uh, I don't know if it would ever become like production ready and people would like uh, you know compile everything they write in Elm with this. Probably not, maybe, but but it is. I think it is really valuable as a like. 
sandbox, uh, you know, playground to see what happens. Uh, for example, the experimentation, like, let's say you see like prepack, you know, JavaScript has the prepack uh, tool that's uh, kind of like, uh, like computes everything it can at compile time and just gives you like JavaScript that really needs to, you know, work with user defined values or whatever. And so you might say, okay, Elm is like pure and uh, free of side effects. We could really like, comp like uh, compute everything down to like this small core and it might be a nice optimization, right? But right now we don't know, but we can try, we can, you know, uh, get some numbers back and we can see. So, awesome. I, I hope uh, I piqued your interest, but you know, how do you write a compiler? Like, like how do you even start? And so if you, if you Google this, if you read a book, if you go to Wikipedia, uh, you get the free stage compiler, uh, which is like the canonical way to do this. Uh, on one side, you have the source code, which might look like this for the sake of example. Uh, and then you parse it. So you go from the like meaningless string to some structure, which uh, I called AST, uh, abstract syntax tree, is just like custom type, right? What, what Richard talk about. So you go from this to some structure. And then you optimize it. So you try to make the AST like functionally the same, but better in some way. It might be for speed, for like space usage or whatever, right? So you might, uh, you know, if you, if you are the optimizer, you might look, okay, that's a multiplication. Those are like integer literals. I can do this right now. <laughs> and so you do. And okay, I can do this again. Yes, yes. And you end up with x equals mi minus 11. At that point, optimizations are done. And then you just emit JavaScript or whatever is the target language you want to emit. So you go from x equals minus 11, pardon the, the image quality, and you end up with JavaScript. So that's kind of, like, you can kind of think about it as this pipeline, which like until very recently, it was really how it looked in, in the source code. So, so we, we parse, there are some more uh, like uh, phases. So we infer types, we desugar, which means uh, we simplify the language. So let's say if you really had uh, where syntax and let syntax, you wouldn't want to like, uh, you know, deal with both of those in each step because they are like kind of the same, right? So you dish your where into let and then only deal with let in the rest of the stages. So that's kind of how it looks. So uh, I don't want to, I don't want to talk you through every step and like how to do everything. I want to just give you some highlights of what I have learned and uh, like uh, some tips and tricks. So parsing, like, Every time I go parsing, my only thought is this. Like, I, for some reason, I have really big troubles with like doing parsers, and like, I would really much rather like uh, write JSON decoders all day than write some parser. Uh, I don't know. For some reason, it doesn't click with me very well. Uh, so, uh, the, I guess the idiomatic way of uh, writing parsers in Elm is Elm slash parser. Uh, in, zero uh, in 018 there were more like uh, uh, libraries for this, but I guess in 019 this is the way to go. And so you start, you know, writing parsers for like modules, for exposing, whatever, imports, bar, s, whatever, exposing, whatever. Like, Kind of nice. Then you go to the expression, which suddenly like explodes in like complexity, but it's it is doable. And then you go to binary operators, and I, I guess you you have to uh, like uh, experience it to really understand it. But it it just blows up. Like there is something about like complexity of parsing this into like the, like putting the parentheses in the right like uh, place. 
uh, Evan, Evan so himself, you know, like he has this example uh, called math.elm and uh, it only deals with like plus and multiplication and he says like, this is kind of tricky, like this is getting complex. It's not going to get any better when you add like more of those operators. And, but I want to say, no, 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 there's one weird trick and it's called spread parsers. And so this is like, um, it's abstraction for parsing, uh, you know, precedence, associativity, binary operators, but also like function calls or whatever. And if you look at the libraries for like uh, JavaScript spread parsers or Python spread parsers, they all use the terminology from the original paper, which is not that great. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of like uh, weird abbreviations and uh, like naming like LED, which means like parser that can, uh, you know, take one thing from the left and like, how are you supposed to know this, right? It's, it's kind of weird, but in Elm, we have a great package. Uh, so I hope I say your name right, like Remy Lefebvre, sorry. <laughs> he created a Elm Pred Parcel library and really put a lot of thought into like uh, the naming, the API. And I think it's the best uh, like Pred Parcel library like in the world of libraries in, in the world of programming languages. So I think that's really like telling of the Elm community and its drive for like great APIs, great naming, understandability, like, you know, friendliness, developer friendliness. And so, so thank you, DMI, and also, also thank you, Elias and uh, Marek, for helping me with parsers when I was stuck and I was like just hopeless. Um, you know, you were uh, just explaining stuff to me, unblocking me. Thank you very much. Uh, type inference. So I'm just gonna go, go quickly through this. We use Hindley Milner algorithm, uh, also called algorithm W, and it's basically just looking at your expressions and deducing, you know, constraints from them, uh, type constraints. So let's play a game. What is the type of this? In Number integer. Yeah, let's say integer again. Let's, let's uh, stay simple. What is the type of this? We don't know, we don't know, right? Like, foo is a function, but we don't know what's the result, right? The only thing we can say foo is a function from integer or number to something. What about now? All right, so I, I hear boolean. So, so all of this is a boolean, right? Because of the equals. There's a string, there's a number. What can we say about the function foo, ra foo now? Yes, I hear a string, so it goes from integer to a string, right? So, because of those different constraints, we we were able to, you know, get uh, get all the like types right. So you can do this in your head, and it, that's exactly what the Hilde Miller algorithm does. So it generates constraints from the sub-expressions, and then puts them together and it tries to be as general as possible. Like, I guess what it would like to do is just give you like A and B and be done with it. But you know, if it sees an if, it knows that the test has to be a Boolean, right? So, and that's it. There are some more uh, like things like let polymorphism and whatever, but let's not go there. So, optimizing. Uh, so, our optimizations look like this. So you take the expression and you try to do something with it. If you can, you return it in a just. If not, you return it. Uh, you return nothing, right? So that's an example. So let's say you know we see plus and two literals. So we can do, do it right now, right? We don't have to make the user calculate it each time the page runs. So we return the new simplified expression or nothing. So we have more of these and we com combine them together to one function, which takes an impression, uh, takes an expression and tries to make another one. Uh, the way this works is the, uh, like the, the optimizations are tried from the leaves up, from the children up, and you know, they are interleaves, so, so we try to each, each one uh, run, e sorry, we try to run each one of those 
And if all of them return nothing, then we know we are done, right? So we go up and try again and up and try again. And so I created a library for this, but it's really just a port of like a Haskell lens library, uh, like two functions from there. So you can go and uh, check those out. And okay, so, so uh, library. How, how would we like to, uh, this to look, right? So, so M compiler as library, we probably want to expose the parser. Uh, so you can give it a string, you can give it uh, multiple files, whatever. Uh, we want uh, the user to be able to, you know, uh, infer types. And again, the more stuff you give it, the more it will be able to deduce, right? So we want to give it not just one expression, but multiple. Uh, we want the optimizations, so you know the default default list of optimizations, or you can give it your own and emit to JavaScript or possibly like native binary or Elixir or, or what have you, right? If you have the emit expression function, you can do this. And we can probably create an interpreter at this point. And so again, same schema. So this is the first draft. Uh, we have to yet to like see if this is useful. We have to like eat our, our own dog food on uh, on some toy project. So so this is not set in stone. This is just the first draft. You can come help me with this. And so that segues into my next kind of section. Like what's next? And what's next? is I need your help because there are a lot of to-dos and it's a big project, but uh, I really want it to be like community driven. I want it to be like uh, not just like one person project. I want people to like have fun experimenting, trying, and I want it to be like useful for uh, people writing interesting stuff in Elm. And so, yeah, we have uh, like, you know where, where uh, Richard had the slide with like the expression type. Uh, so we have probably like not even half of those implemented. Like we have you know like literals, if, let, whatever. But we don't have like records or whatever. So there's more stuff to be done. We we have to publish. CLI tool will probably be nice. Uh, let's use it on something interesting and uh, get your feedback. And let's experiment, right? Like we can try different optimizations, we can try different like syntax, we can try different like type inference algorithms, right? So higher kind of, kind of types or GADTs or whatever. We can we, we can have fun and much more. So you can find it here. Here's the GitHub repo. Uh, I created a Discord server. Uh, there's like two people there right now, but you can count. <laughs> this is the big unveiling, un right? So uh, I tried to persuade the Elm Slack admins to create me a channel, but uh, because there was no discussion yet about it, uh, you know, there was no reason. So maybe when there's more chatter about Elm in, in, Elm in the Elm Slack, maybe we can create a channel, but not right now. We can go to the Discord and you can find me on Twitter. So thank you. So just one question about this example use case clips. What is that? Uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't I didn't talk about that. So clips is uh, uh, I don't know like service or framework uh, to embed code snippets into like blog posts, and uh, the readers of the blog posts can run them and edit them, right? So so it needs the language to be like uh, runnable in like browser, which we can't do it, right? Unless you compile Elm in something that runs on the browser. So that would be unlocked with the with this project. Cool, thanks. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Yeah, you, you said that it's complete, yeah, but I wonder if we have to have enough to now be might be like you're talking about embedding it in the browser. How big might it be? I don't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
Uh, not yet, but uh, like right now, it doesn't even make sense to like measure it because it like the language does so little, right? But it it compiles to. Uh, I didn't try to do like the. Uh, like A2 and F2 tricks uh, that uh, Evan does in the original compiler. I try to just create as simple JavaScript as possible, so it might be fast. But again, like I didn't measure anything uh, big yet. Uh, sorry, so so the question is uh, like to to be the date. Doing that to the development of the original implementation. We don't do that right now, but uh, we plan to have like a like we plan to have a test suite with some like examples like this goes in, this goes out, or like compiler error or whatever. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a possible thing to try to to run against the original compiler. Uh, we, we can try that. Like uh, we didn't try it. Yes, we can try. Yes. Uh, do we have time for more? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, do you? I also plan to tackle things like downloading packages and building whole projects um, or stuff like that. So uh, it would be probably a nice thing for the CLI tool, but probably not for the library. So, so I think the library as it is now uh, would probably have to take all the source code, uh, you know, like as an input. So, so it wouldn't have like a standard library baked in. Uh, but again, this is all like it's not set in stone. Uh, we have to see like m m maybe maybe it will be a constraint. M maybe we will have to do it. But uh, right now, like as of what is implemented, we don't download packages. But uh, I think for the CLI it makes sense, and for the library maybe, but maybe not. Why is it nice logo? <laughs> yes, I'm proud of it. <laughs> yeah, it looks really nice. And the question is, have you been doing this for uh, for yourself or for your work's reason? Uh, it's just uh, for myself. Like, uh, you know, our work uh, with Elm, like in my company, we didn't really need to do <laughs> like whole Elm compiler. But it is just side project, but I think it's an important one. Okay, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's uh, everything went okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ma Martin. Thank you.